and life in Morningside. Move on up to RBS. We interrupt our regular programming to bring you this special bulletin from RBS News. Horror comes in many different forms, from cosmic horror to monster movies to movies about serial killers and aliens from another planet. There's something for everyone to enjoy. One of the most popular kinds as of recently is that of found footage in analog horror, horror that generally stems from the idea of footage being found of old tapes made by things like police departments or scientists that generally paint a creepy picture. Well what if I told you the idea of analog horror isn't exactly a new idea, but a repurposing and redoing of another form of horror, the horror mockumentary. For this video, I want to look at two of these that I think aren't talked about as much as the other ones you may have heard of. So no, Ghostwatch and Orson Welles' War of the Worlds will not, and I repeat, not be on here, as those have been covered to death in comparison to all the others in the genre. And I find this genre, when done correctly, can be extremely effective and sticks with people a little bit longer than a lot of the other ones, as usually they have to play their cards perfectly in order for this to work. They have to show it exactly the same way as a news broadcast would cover something, because if they didn't, it would take you out immediately. So I feel like a lot of these films have to be researched a lot in order to be done correctly. So the three that we are looking at today are ones that are somewhat well known, but may have been forgotten underneath the large controversies caused by Ghostwatch and War in the Worlds. And I won't deny, Ghostwatch does this genre nearly perfectly. It plays into the newscast idea extremely well, with hiring a lot of BBC newscasters, which I think makes it work really well. And the way Ghostwatch does it is perfect with having the ghost only appear in the background like you would in a newscast. It wouldn't be like a jump scare, it would just be in the background, which I think makes it work perfectly. I also would have covered Lake Mungo, but I don't think it would have fit in with the crowd of movies that we're looking at because that one isn't exactly a news broadcast, but more of a mock documentary, and it isn't filmed in the same way. And I think Link Mungo has not been done to death and I might just cover it in the future because it's just something that is really good but it doesn't really fit in with the news broadcast style of horror. I also would have covered the last broadcast but I don't think it would have fit in as well because I consider that to be more of a found footage film rather than a mockumentary like the others. And while I think found footage and mockumentaries are related, I don't think they are the same. So that's why I'm not covering that film. And the only reason I'm not covering Ghostwatch is that it's been done to death. You've probably already seen two or three videos covering it alone, so I won't waste your time talking about it any longer. Instead, we're going to take a look at two that you might have heard of but aren't as popular as the other ones. These are films that did well at the time but have kind of been lost to history due to just how big of a shadow was cast by Ghostwatch and Orson Welles' War of the Worlds. For today though, we are going to look at and be taking a deep dive on Special Bulletin and Without Warning. But before we go any further, remember to like and subscribe, and if you liked the video, let me know in the comments down below what you thought of it. Now, let's get on with the video. Special Bulletin is a 1983 made-for-TV movie set around a news broadcast about a group of terrorists that take over a boat in downtown Charleston and takes a news reporter hostage. The terrorists use the cameraman and news reporter to show what's going on inside of the boat, so they can communicate with news anchor John Woodley, played by Ed Flanders, to try and share their message with the world. The terrorists are a group of scientists and activists who want to share their message of anti-nuclear warfare by taking people hostage and creating a makeshift nuclear bomb that they say multiple times that they don't actually want to blow up but just to send a message to the world about the horrors of nuclear destruction. However, things go dire really, really quickly, as the terrorists begin to become more erratic as they realize that the government is not taking their requests and instead of waiting for them to come out to see if their threats are really founded. The government then cuts the power to the city and raid the boat, causing the terrorists to be killed or commit suicide in the US government to try and go down and defuse the bomb. 
But as stated earlier in the film multiple times, the bomb is impossible to defuse unless it's by the terrorist who created it, Dr. McKesson. So the US government messes up defusing the bomb, which to the shock of any of the viewers, causes the bomb to blow up, completely leveling all of Charleston. And I know when I was watching it, I was actually surprised that they went through with it. When watching the film, you think multiple times that it won't actually blow up and it just might just be a big setup, but it in fact isn't. It levels the whole city. And in an instant, we see the news reporter that we had been hoping would be saved the whole film get obliterated instantly, and one of the news reporters who thought they were a safe distance have all their crew besides one other person get completely evaporated in front of them. And in one of the most harrowing scenes, we see the girl who survived getting interviewed as she has a mental breakdown at the sight of all of her dead colleagues. The rest of the film goes to the devastation of Charleston as they interview people harmed within the devastation, with the only shining light being the casualty count being low due to the good evacuation time by the government. This film encapsulates the Cold War era in America perfectly due to the way it talks about and shows the situation and the way they try to figure out what's going on. One of the main factors that the news points out behind the creation of the bomb is that one of the terrorist is a communist, which I think shows the Cold War era fears surrounding nuclear weapons and the Red Scare. And this film holds no punches back. They show how horrific the nuclear destruction would be and how everything is just set ablaze. I remember watching it, I was actually surprised that they pulled this off. It's such a shocking film and it was surprising that they were able to show this, especially during the Cold War. And this film perfectly shows what life was like back then, as people lived in constant fear of a real life situation like this happening. It also helps that the portrayal of the characters and the way the newscasters talk about the situation is perfect. When watching it, rarely you'll be taken out of the idea that it could be a real news broadcast as even the way they talk in the films will remind you of a real news broadcast as they don't speak perfectly. There's mess ups constantly and they have to cut off people all the time. One of the best moments of the film is when the terrorists get fed up with Woodley and start going after the way Woodley is covering the news especially being a commentary on how the news covers such a disturbing topics. Instead of showing the actual shock and terror of situations that truly hurt people, they simplify it to sell the story as much as possible, a message that stands true more than ever today. But this does not mean we should side with the terrorists, as they are literally the level one of the largest cities in the south. Overall, this film is extremely well put together, and I would highly recommend giving it a watch, as it will put you on the edge of your seat the whole time while watching it. Without Warning is a 1994 made-for-TV film about a meteorite hitting rural parts of the world around Wyoming, France, and China, which the news makes a broadcast as the world tries to figure out what could be happening with these meteorites. See, they find the meteorite to be so mysterious as they split off and land at the exact same longitude across the Earth, which seems to be completely mathematically impossible, which leads people to believe the meteorite was caused by extraterrestrials. Suddenly, out of one of the areas struck by the meteorite walks out a girl who looks to be badly burned, and when the news goes up and tries to talk to her, she talks in a way that seems to make absolutely no sense whatsoever. And then at the French site, they find a man who seems to be talking in a similar way, that also makes no sense whatsoever. Then out of the meteorites, a loud piercing noise begins to pierce radio signals as people start to think that there might be something much larger going on. As the sound sounds so distinctly ear piercing that there has to be something strange going on with the meteorite itself. Next, as a large object makes an appearance over the United States, they send two jets to go and take it down with nuclear weapons. However, after destroying it, the two jets are engulfed by a light causing them to go missing and be destroyed. As that happens, they interview a NASA scientist who tells them how badly they messed up because he believes the aliens are the same species who come here every hundreds of years and that the reason they sent it to the purposely rural areas is as a way to communicate it with us without destroying a major city before they made first contact. But with us destroying their ship, we have now declared war and they will of course retaliate. 
they retaliated by sending three meteorites towards the capital cities of the world powers, DC, Moscow, and Beijing. As the meteorites approached, they deciphered the message by the girl and the man, which actually ends up being the message that was put on Voyager 2, revealing that the NASA scientist was correct and it was actually aliens trying to make first contact with humanity. The world seems to be saved when the US and other countries all nuke the meteorites, keeping them from destroying the major cities. But in the most infamous scene, we see the news reporter realize that the once cheering scientist have went completely silent and goes to check of why they could have possibly stopped. When he himself stops in his tracks as the camera pans over and reveals this. I'm told his name is Patrick. Patrick, Patrick, just move the camera to the screen. Show us what you're seeing on the screen. Patrick, do you read the... Open Show silos. us what's on the... Track trajectories. No, there's too many. There's too many to calculate. Now, oh my God. Is this is in France. Do you copy? The movie then ends with the news anchor reading off a Shakespeare quote as we hear the radios from all the cities begin to go silent one by one. This film is of course a recreation of Orson Welles' War of the Worlds broadcast done in the style of a 90s television broadcast. However, this translates extremely well to the live television format as they play it completely straight and keep the timeline going in a way that makes sense. It doesn't jump around in time, instead keeping it in one singular night, making it one long disastrous invasion. However, I will say while the one, this one is extremely good, I don't think it as good as a job as Special Bulletin did as there were some parts of the film that got extremely, extremely cheesy. But once again, I would recommend you watch this film and try to get a version with the original ad, as it really adds with the experience of the film. As it will immerse you into actually watching the newscast, it will feel like you're watching a real television broadcast, not just a TV movie. This relates back to analog horror as the way it leads things together feels like the same way an analog horror tape would do it. It keeps the story in an analog format that being a newscast will not strain from it and keeping it brutally realistic even if the story itself is fantastical completely. I think that's what also makes it a good analog horror, because even if the idea is supernatural and realistic, the way the world handles it is treated with an extremely realistic taste. And that is what makes me think that the films like this definitely had a hand in inspiring this subgenre of horror. But before I go, remember to like and subscribe, and let me know down below what you thought of the video, and I will see you guys all next week.